It is 5.30. I'd like to call the public hearing to order, please. If everyone would stand for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you all for being here. Um, just to let you all know, one of the highest priorities of this administration, this board, is to strengthen our neighborhoods and to reinvest in our neighborhoods to make those neighborhoods stronger for everyone who lives here and to create a welcoming environment for more people to move back to Peoria Heights. So what we're going to do tonight is explain the plan at hand. Uh, Nick Nelson with Klein and Associates. Uh, Nick is uh, our TIF consultant. He's also an attorney and he'll explain the plan and then we'll take plenty of questions and comments from um, the audience. So we'll, when we get to that point, uh, we'll have you all come up unless you just have a simple question that Nick can answer. We'll, we'll do it that way. But if you'd like to make a comment for the record, we'll have you come up individually. So go right ahead, Nick. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, has any, everyone signed the sign-in sheet or close to it? I think it's still working its way around. Okay. Um, as the mayor said, uh, the, the village is um, expecting to do a First Amendment to its uh, TIF District 2 plan. Um, they're actually considering bringing in some additional properties and adding some additional projects to the plan. Um, so the purpose of tonight's meeting, the TIF Act says that any time we have a TIF that has 75 or more residential units, um, that we have to have a just kind of a general uh, public meeting where we go over kind of TIF 101 type stuff, um, go over the, the probable boundary of what the TIF is going to look like after this amendment is over with and then take any questions or comments that the, um, that the public has. So um, just kind of a rough TIF 101 in a nutshell. So um, I don't know what everybody's familiarity is with TIF districts, but um, one thing to be clear about is it's not an extra tax. It's not a separate tax on your property. Um, in some counties, the tax bill that you get will have a separate line item for a TIF payment, um, but that's not an additional uh, an add-on to the taxes that you already pay. It's, it's more a creation of the fact that your, um, your property values go up and the revenue attributable to that increase in property value from the inception of the TIF moving forward instead of going to the taxing bodies like your school district, county, um, the village general fund. Instead of going to those taxing bodies, it gets redirected into the village's TIF account. Um, so it's not an extra tax or add on to your tax bill, even though it may show that on the line item on the tax bill that you do get. Um, TIF districts are one of the few uh, tools that a municipality has to help uh, encourage economic development. Um, and it's also a great source of revenue to undertake public projects um, that may, be, may need to be done um, throughout the village that are located within the TIF district. So essentially how it works is once the TIF is in place, and I will, um, I'll start off by saying this TIF 2 was uh, established in 2015, so it is already in place. We're just adding new properties, so we kind of have to go through the whole process of public hearings and a convening of the taxing bodies, kind of, kind of like we're doing a new TIF just to simply add a couple parcels or a few parcels. Um, so this one was established in 2015. So what ends up happening is once the TIF district is established, all of the valuations for all property within that area are essentially frozen. And so all the tax revenue that comes from that up to that amount of valuation will still get routed to the taxing bodies just as it always has. Now, as new development occurs within the TIF area and property values increase because of that development, uh, the, the tax revenue that comes from that increase in valuation, instead of going to the taxing body, to the, again, the school, the county, the, the village, um, township, it goes into the village's TIF account. And then the village can use that money for certain public and private TIF eligible costs. Um, now, the public stuff is pretty self-evident. It can be used for streets, sewer, sidewalk, water lines, that kind of thing. Um, any kind of capital type expense that the village may have. And again, those projects generally have to be located within the TIF district, within the boundaries of it. But the village can spend money on those types of things. The other um, probably more important thing that the municipality can do with that money is they can incentivize private development. And so a lot of, um, a lot of you have probably seen a lot of the projects that have gone on already with Treskers and um, the, the, a lot of the other stuff, especially in the Heritage Square had an expansion and all of that, all of those were TIF projects. 
And so um, on the private side, it's the TIF redevelopment agreement that really controls that. The village is free to negotiate any possibility of terms with developers to, inset, to share any of the tax revenue that the developer might generate. And again, any of that increased revenue caused by the project, um, or they can use money from um, elsewhere in the TIF district to incentivize development. So. Um, the, the revenues that get reimbursed to developers, they do have to be for TIF eligible costs. So that's generally everything involved in a development except for vertical new construction cost. Um, but land acquisition is a TIF eligible expense. Um, any kind of rehab work, so what was done with Trefskers, that building was already there, but they had to do millions of dollars on the inside to get it up to um, where it can be used for what its use is today. And so all of the rehab type expenses are TIF eligible. Um, any kind of professional fees for accountants, engineers, architects, that kind of thing are eligible costs. So, um, a TIF district is in place for 23 years. It can be legislatively extended for an additional 12 years, um, but that generally has to be done at the state legislature level. And in order to get that, you really need all the taxing bodies to approve of that before the state would even consider adopting that type of legislation. Um, so, most TIF districts are 23, uh, 23 years in length. Um, Money can be um, can be shared with local taxing bodies. So I know there is a, there is an agreement with the local school district to share a part of that increment um, to help defray some of the costs um, that are brought on, brought about because of the TIF district. So. Um, I think that's really all I got. As far as what's being added by this amendment, um, basically, if you go down Prospect Avenue heading south, it's the probably two or three blocks running along the west side of Prospect Avenue, crossing, um, crossing War Memorial and then heading west. And it picks up some of that property to the west, kind of by um, where, the, where the other dog is, um, is moving to, capturing the McDonald's, and then kind of moving out in that direction again to accommodate some of the projects that are, we're wanting some TIF incentives. So, Nick, um, one of the reasons we're proposing to draw the map the way we are is because to include the residential properties that's one of our goals is to invest money in these neighborhoods. Can you talk about, we've asked you to develop a housing plan specifically for this neighborhood. Can you explain how that might look and how it might benefit people who want to improve their home? Sure. Um, so we have, we have several other communities um, where we have home improvement programs and so Generally, if, if you have an older home and you do, you could sink a lot of money into an older home, it's not going to generate a lot, in, a lot in the way of increased um, valuation as far as tax, property tax goes. Um, but if, if, this, if the village's TIF account has accumulated some funds, the village can share that money with local homeowners and incentivize um, improving, you know, the, the outside of the home to make it to, you know, for beautification type purposes or to do any kind of rehab work. Again, all rehab expenses are TIF eligible costs. And so um, as part of this plan, the village is, is proposing um, that it will likely do some sort of a, a, a program like that where it could be either in the form of a matching grant. So you spend, you know, for example, $10,000 to, you know, paint the front of your house, you know, put a new roof on, and the village might match that up, a, up to a certain percentage, those types of programs. And in other places where we've done that, they've been very, very successful. Thank you. And then uh, again, one of the things that we would like to consider eventually is a corridor plan for Monroe Avenue. Uh, that's one of the neighborhoods we think is very important to Peoria Heights. And uh, once we get the piece done with House Levine, who does our planning, uh, we'd like to implement and bring to the board consideration for a, a study of that corridor, how to uh, lighting, um, maybe put uh, things in place that would slow down the traffic on that road, all those sorts of things. So again, the goal is to really strengthen this neighborhood and this is one area we're proposing to start in with the whole heights is open for consideration. Um, before we go any further, Madam Clerk, uh, let's call the roll of the board present. Trustee Carter. Present. Trustee Mariscal. Trustee Kazam. Present. Trustee Gatt. Trustee Weisenberg. Present. Trustee DeVore. Present. Okay, thank you. So we'll stop there. If you have a question, just raise your hand and Nick can answer it. But if you want to make a public comment, please come forward, give your name and address, and um, we'll make sure that gets in the written record. Yes. 
Are the residential pro programs already in place? In other words, can I find out how I start the process? Yeah, the village doesn't have a program it's adopted just yet. Um, now, I will say, um, despite whatever program they may have in the future, anybody that has any potential project can certainly go to the village, fill out a TIF application, and um, we do the analysis to determine you know, what, the, what the actual TIF eligible costs related to that project are, and if it generates any type of real estate tax increment or you know, TIF revenue, and we can do that analysis to determine if that's, that project would be good for, for its own separate redevelopment agreement. So, so that's something you can always do if, you, if there's a vacant lot and you want to build a home, you can come to the village and fill out an application and, and we can do that type of well, thing on an, I know, on an individual basis. Um, once the program's in place, you know, you guys will all be, you know, see that and then they'll be available. And this is kind of consistent with our uh, business development district. I think that's it's going to be a similar program. That's a ten thousand dollar matching grant. I see. I mean, I know when it's in its infancy stages, but I kind of see that rolling out the same way. Um, I'm not sure what the board's number they'll put on that, but I see that, and that's been very successful for our business development district. But it would work similar to that. So. And, and if I may, uh, we, you know, we're lucky to have a lot of development going on in the Heights right now. It seems to be occurring on Prospect Avenue, but uh, we regularly have people who show interest in the War Memorial Drive corridor, other more high traffic um, dependent businesses. But we really want to be able to take some of that money that's generated by that development and reinvest it in the neighborhood. So that, again, that's really what we're trying to accomplish here. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned rehabilitation of, of property, uh, individual residences. Is that only um, exterior, or could that be interior also? Um, it's ultimately up to the village and what type of program they want to they want to adopt. But but you know, as far as what's an eligible cost under the TIF Act, it could be any type of rehab, whether it's inside or out. Uh, a lot a lot of the communities we represent who have that type of program are mostly concerned with the outer you know the outer parts of the buildings and the sidewalks and and you know the stuff that's visible from the street. But there's nothing preventing the village from doing like an internal home rehab. Type Type, type program. Done. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, rehabilitation in terms of you said paint and roofing. Is there somewhere where we can see uh, the criteria? I understand you haven't adopted anything as of yet, but what some examples of the criteria may be for uh, whether it's approved or not? Uh, yeah, it'll be uh, well. It'll ultimately be up to the village and what type of program it adopts and what the criteria are. Just from a legal standpoint, all of those types of costs would be eligible for reimbursement under under the TIF Act. Now, what conditions the village wants to attach to the funds? That you know, I think they're still going to have to decide that. Um, so it could be you know, you have to spend a certain dollar amount, or you know, we're going to cover this type of project as far as you know, only the what's visible from the street level. I mean, all the, all that stuff is yet to be figured out. I, th I think we'd really want to hear from the neighbors. What is it you're most interested in? Is it sidewalk improvement? Is it lighting? Or is it you know reinvestment in, in the homes, the housing stock, uh, the facade? So we're quite interested to hear what everyone has to say about that. Yes, sir. Well, I just bought a house down on Sayota. And one of the biggest problems I've run into, and I've talked to several people in the government you know, the local government or whatever about what's acceptable, what's not, as far as uh, properties being up to a certain level of uh, rehabilitation or properties being up to a certain level. I hate to use this word, but it's the word they use everywhere else in the United States. Up to a level of code or a level of code enforcement, so if you're electrical, you're plumbing, all these systems are up to a level that are not dangerous, but they're also up to a level where it increases the safety of the occupants. Now, obviously, this is a neighborhood area of a lot of older homes. So if anything was done from the 50s forward, it was done on a case-by-case -case benefit. And I'm really concerned about doing any more, uh, you know, painting with a big brush before we see some sort of a, a program or whatever that's going to name out at least some basic framework of what we can do to rehab these old properties, bring them up, 
put some pride back in ice. So that's that's what I'm concerned about. I mean, just giving you a carte blanche on this, forgive me, but I don't know yet. So that's one of those things. I mean, this is an act of faith that once we do this, that the property, things as far as private individuals or private properties are actually going to be able to get some work that they sadly need rather than just slap a little paint, fix a couple cracks in the sidewalk or whatever like that because I'll be honest, I'd rather not worry about the crack in the sidewalk as the house burning down because the gas lines haven't been touched in 30. I mean, it's a little ridiculous. So I just wanted to put that out. No, that's a good. That's a good question. Do you want to take the first shot at that? About I think uh, that would also involve the landlord. Well, our uh, the program we implemented about a year ago, the landlord registration program, kind of touches on a lot of the things you just mentioned: uh, electrical, um, just quality of life issues inside the house. Um, and what we've seen over the last year are a ton of those issues. Uh, but we've also seen a lot of compliance. So uh, great point, and that's one reason that we implemented this program a year ago so it is working and I agree with you I don't think we should just just concentrate on cosmetic issues but we have to work on on more important issues so I think we're getting there with everything we've done with the new code enforcement the landlord registration program I think we're moving in the right direction this is a component of that so um, very very uh, good points all the way around and uh, I think I think we're moving in the right direction so yes yeah, my mom's 84. Are we talking about her losing her home to this development? Um, if you're talking about eminent domain, um, under the TIF Act, if, if the village were going to use that power um, for a TIF project, it'd have to be in the TIF plan. This plan doesn't contain anything about taking a property. Um, now, I will say, you know, if the village wants to acquire a property, there's hundreds of sources of eminent, eminent domain powers that have nothing to do with TIF. Um, but the, the, there's no plan for that within, within this TIF plan, either the original plan or the amendment that we're doing to actually take anybody's home. Um, so. Yeah, there is absolutely no intention of the village. All, all we want to do is try to make money available to, for the neighbors to invest in your own homes and your own properties. There's no intent for the village to develop any of this neighborhood. So, um, I mean, we want, the, it's the neighborhoods that give the village of Peoria Heights its strength. We want to continue to strengthen the neighborhoods and, and, and do the best we can for policing and for code enforcement and now to make money available to homeowners to use this development money that's occurring here for you to uh, use it to invest in your properties. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to criticize another sister city, but there's a city nearby that's used TIF in, a, in my opinion, in a very bad way. And uh, they've shortchanged their schools and the neighbors have been shortchanged. Um, we don't do that here. Our, our schools, as Nick pointed out, get a, a full um, seat at the table when we talk about development and uh, we don't shortchange them on the TIF agreements. And here is where it's really unusual for a, a, a community to want a neighborhood in a TIF, but we want this for the neighborhoods to be strengthened. So that, that's the whole reason we're doing this, or we're asking so to do it. What you're saying is, is to improve what's already there. Is, am I correct in other Yes, that? yes. Okay, thank you. And for what it's worth, I would add, um, a TIF plan cannot change the local zoning and code. So whatever, whatever zoning is in place right now, um, you know, the, the TIF plan won't change that. Now, you could go through a separate zoning process. So if you're in the middle of a residential neighborhood, it will stay as that unless the village decides to, to change the zoning. But that has to be un done under the zoning ordinance it has rather than the actual TIF plan. So this, this doesn't change anything as far as that goes either. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. So in order to qualify an area uh, for TIF to begin with, it has to be defined as blighted. And the TIF Act has I think well over 10 different characteristics and it has, a, has to have a combination of those characteristics present throughout the entire area to qualify for a TIF in the first place. So um, a handful of the ones that are most common, what you would 
typically think of as blight, so your deterioration of the structures, of the sidewalk, of the streets. Um, if you've had a, an equalized assessed valuation that has either been stagnant or gone down in, last three, in three of the last five years, that's another big qualifier. Um, any kind of, um, if you, code violations are another one um, that can qualify an area. Uh, any uh, dilapidation, um, all, lack, of, laugh, lack of services, a lack of a plan, a village plan to account for development in the area. So all those types of things feed into the definition of blight under the TIF Act that would qualify the property. And not, now not every single parcel has to exhibit those. So you could have a brand new building in a TIF district, but more properties than not have to have those blighting characteristics in order for your, your overall area to qualify. And, and this area uh, meets the, the, the standard? Yes, it does. Yes. Is there currently a plan for spending money? The TIF plan is that plan. So um, that's the draft of that, of that has been prepared. Um, but the, the original TIF plan is on file with the village. You're welcome to come check it out. Um, actually, and that's for this district too? That, that's for the original district. Um, that plan will apply to what's the new area that's coming into the district. Um, but, th but that's what we're amending is that plan. So it'll, it'll incorporate everything that we had in it before, plus adding some new projects and some new additional project costs in addition to the area that's coming in. Will there be transparency of how the money's being spent? Yes, so every dollar is accounted for and um, at the end of each fiscal year, <laughs> the village does an audit. Um, once the audit is done, then we take that information and we have to actually um, help, we assist the village in preparing the TIF district annual report. And all of those annual reports are on file with the, with the state comptroller's office. So you can go to any municipality, any t of their TIF districts and pull up that annual report. And all of the money that's being spent will show up on there. So it'll have um, you know, any developers that get paid, the, the different types of cost categories that are provided for in the plan and how much money is being paid to those. So there's 100% transparency with every dollar that's spent. Um, on the public side, all, all of those dollars will be or transparently spent as well. And, ev and everything has to be done by village ordinance. So if you come to any meeting, um, it will show up there as well. What might this going to affect? Uh, to finish the, well, let's see. Um, So this, um, following the timeline, this ought to be wrapped up uh, at the um, approval of the final ordinances amending the TIF district on number, November 5th. So after today, there's going to be um, there's going to be a meeting of the joint review board, which is made up of the local taxing bodies, <clears throat> and so um, they'll come in and we'll meet with them and we'll go over the t the TIF plan amendment. And then they get a vote on this, and and their and their vote is advisory only. But and they're not voting on whether they think it's a good idea as a matter of policy. They're voting on whether or not the village is complying with the TIF Act, the process to either establish it or, in this case, to amend it. And they're also voting that the blighting factors are present to a meaningful extent throughout the entire area. Um, well, after that meeting, of the taxing bodies. Then there's going to be one more public hearing. It'll be similar in format to this, but we'll actually have the TIF plan developed by then. Um, so we'll go through more of the details of what the plan has in it as amended. Um, so you guys can kind of see what types of projects will be undertaken. What was the rationale behind uh, selecting only one size of prospect uh, to be included? This surprised me and I know that that was also done with the land. And it's just surprising to me that we would invest on one side of the major street and not both. Mm -hmm. Any comments on that? But the same is for land, the front of the street. Sure. And I can let them, I can let the, um, the village comment on that. But ge generally, you know, most communities don't want to put the entire village in a TIF district. I mean, you do have to draw the, the boundary at some point. And, and most taxing bodies don't want the entire village to be in a TIF district. Um, but the idea is to put, bring as much of it in as you can to benefit the greatest number of people and have, have a wide array of types of projects you can do so that, you know, for instance, you're going to need newer development on vacant ground to help 
sink money into the you know the homes and the older existing businesses where you know those projects may not generate that much increments so like if you do anything to a downtown building you could sink a million dollars into a downtown building that's not going to generate an increase in valuation all that often and it's not going to be very much and so that money has to come from somewhere so usually it's coming from you know a newer vacant you know vacant property where a new building's gone, uh, been built on it and then that money can get funneled into the older parts of town. Um, another reason why you want to be a little more expansive is in order to spend money in the TIF district, the property or where you're spending it has to be located in the TIF. So um, any street work, water lines, sewer lines, that kind of thing, that any kind of public project that has that the village wants to undertake, that look the location of that work has to be within the TIF district. So you want to be as broad as you can to cover as many projects as you can, but not so broad that, you know, again, your all the taxing bodies aren't going to have any growth whatsoever. As far as how this was constructed, I can leave it up to them for more additional comments. Well, the one reason we just concentrate on the west side, not the east, because the east is in the city of Peoria. That's the reason for that. On Prospect. At, at yeah, on prospect. If once you get to the lake. Yeah. And the same answer is for uh, what about the land then? I know we're not talking about that to this but it just surprises me that we would say that major street, part of the major corridor, can designate only one side of this to yeah. just an observation feedback for you to consider. Well, we had to draw the boundaries somewhere, um, and if you look, view this as somewhat of a pilot program, I mean, we can always change the boundaries, correct? I mean, I, there is a cost involved, but, um, you know, moving forward, if the village decides they want to expand it farther west or wh whatever direction, you know, they have the opportunity to do that, correct, Nick? Yeah, you can always amend a TIF to bring new property in, just like they're doing now, or, you know, if you need to, you can do an entirely new TIF district on the other side of the road. So, yeah, um, And really nothing more. We just thought this was a good starting point. We really need to, <clears throat> excuse me, to connect the TIF districts so that they can work to work better together. And while we were connecting them down Prospect, we, we thought that we would add this residential area. So we thought, again, uh, focusing on neighborhoods and focusing on the housing stock, we thought we could use the money from the TIF districts and that's occurring. <laughs> to use this as somewhat of a pilot program. <clears throat> yes, sir? Uh, I have a question and a concern. The, um, the prerequisites that you mentioned for if you're going to do a rehabilitation, whatever, um, evidently aren't quite established yet. Correct. From what I understand. Correct. So I guess I would take that as anyone who's going to be or considering a sort of an improvement project would put an immediate hold on that to wait for whatever your requirements are. If you're going to spend ten thousand dollars tomorrow, why not wait to put out the in a month? If all of a sudden, like you said, there'd be a match of some percentage of it. So when would, would we see those? What, Nick, what would be the timeline as far as the parameters? I'm not really sure, but as far as the answer to your question, sir, I mean, you, we do have TIF applications that you can complete. Now, not knowing the parameters yet, it's going to be hard, you know, for us to, to give you that information until those are set by the board. But as far as the timeline, when you, what would you expect? Uh, well, this TIF is scheduled to be, or the amendment's scheduled to be completed in November. So it'd be sometime after November when the village would do something like that. Um, but you know, it could be any time after that. It's just you know, when they direct us to do the work, we'll we'll put that together, help them put that together. Okay. The one concern that I would have is that um, the way that I understand uh, was that you mentioned the evaluations were in essence frozen, and money that's taken in was already divvied out. Mm -hmm. TIF would accumulate from new valuations. Right. My concern would be so any money to go towards this TIF would come from. All of a sudden, my concern would be, you know, just as a blanket statement, it said, gee, okay, homeowner X, Y, and Z, guess what? Your home is now all of a sudden worth $10,000 more. Now your taxes are X amount more, so we have money for the tip. Well, if I go to sell my house, as more and more employers leave Illinois and Peoria in general, I don't see the valuation of my property going up. And, all of a sudden now I'm right. Well, the county assessor is the one that determines the valuation of your home. And I don't know too many county assessors that would artificially jack up the price of the home because of a village TIF district. Um, but to the extent you know that your valuation goes up higher than you think it should be, 
there there are always avenues available for objecting to your assessed valuation at the county level and trying to get a reassessment based on what the appropriate market value of the home would be. Um, so so those those remedies are out there. That's just that's not a that's not necessarily something that the village can can get involved in. Okay, but there's not going to be like a okay now we have a tip we're going to look to reevaluate all your houses. <laughs> Guess what? They won't go on. Up. Yeah. Well, Again, the county does that, not the, not the village, so yeah, right. Yeah, so the, the township assessor actually goes out and appraises the value of all the commercial residential property, and um, that's done quadrennial. I think every four mm -hmm. years um, it, it's done, and then the county issues those tax bills, so. Yeah, mo mo most of the revenue comes from new new projects, not not necessarily inflationary increases in like homeowners valuations. And, and I can tell you based on history, especially in Illinois, like you mentioned, EAVs are not going up any meaningful amount in most places, and, and this area is no exception to that. Yes, sir? Um, my question was your previous comment, and you said that the purpose of extend, one of the purposes of extending it, in, in addition to the other benefits, was to make the two TIF -TIF districts work better together. And what can you explain to us what that is? Yeah, so TIF districts generally have to be adjoining to be, and, and once that happens, then you can share money between the TIF districts. So revenue generated in one TIF can be used for cost incurred in an in a adjacent TIF district. Um, but then also just again for a scope of projects, the village is trying to bring in new new areas that they can funnel money into, like the you know the older home type areas, so they can do these um, home improvement type programs. Well, and again, there's a lot of there's a lot of development going on in what we call the downtown that the uh, and it, it's just thriving. But we believe that there could be more development occur along War Memorial Drive and. It, if the two were one, and that, so the one, the money that's ha uh, generated here, uh, just down the street, could be used to help development along War Memorial Drive. So that's part of that reasoning too. Just mention War Memorial Drive again. Yes. Um, is there something now in the books that's already you know, being talked about for a developer aiming to develop the residential area on War Memorial, or just already you know? Well, the two things that we've talked about recently, we have uh, relocated the subway building. We're in, uh, we've been working with that and also the other dog, which is on, currently on prospect. I think the other dog might be open now. But those are the two things that we've, we've uh, worked on relocating. So uh, one's on War Memorial on Monroe would be subway, and the other one would be behind Leonardo's. And I think the other dog, uh, they're actually moved already and should be opening soon. So those are two projects that that that's, it is behind some of this, uh, you know, TIF expansion because that can be used in for TIF funds to, uh, you know, relocate them because of the new development on Prospect. No, no. There's been a ton of ventures, but um, you know, nothing that nothing concrete that we've heard of. So right now it's just a two re relocation, but there have been a lot of ventures on Ward Drive. So. Exactly what type of businesses are you looking to have on Memorial Drive? Is it such a, a, a high traffic and that would create a real problem to have a lot of commercial businesses there, which Subway might contribute to that? But it's like, are you planning on having fast food restaurants and things like that? Because I think in other parts of Florida, say that has not been desirable actually to the neighborhoods to have that type of development on a busy strip like that. Well, I can't foresee the future, obviously, um, but I understand what you're saying. Uh, we do have Hassel Levine, who will be doing some studies for us. We've used them in the past, um, and we will rely on them, too, to look at that corridor and see what, what would best fit the village. Uh, we're using them for Galena Road as well. Obviously, with uh, the capital bill that we've received, the $68.5 million. So we will continue to use them to look at all the corridors and heights and see what's the best fit for us. So. Samuel then? Because on Samuel, um, I think that it was a that came in and said these properties are blighted. And I don't think you're going to buy out of those properties, throwing them down and plug in um, new townhouses. 
and bundles. And was going to charge real high. Right. right. So what happened? So that was not the village acquiring those properties. That was a private developer going to the individual homeowners and offering to purchase them. So they were not forced to sell, but they chose to sell. And then once the developer acquired those properties, um, that particular developer does have an agreement. And so then she was free to demolish those and build according to what her plan says and what the redevelopment uh, plan has in it. So so that, that, that wasn't a forced sale. That was, that was the choice of the homeowners to sell to her. So, so someone just taking the property, uh, the developer might come yeah. and just say, well, I'm, I'm interested in your property. Sure. But, but, but that would be the individual homeowner's choice of what happens. Exactly right. So if you're located next to a commercial lot right now, it's quite possible you'd have a private developer show up at your door and say, I'd like to buy your property so I can expand my business. And it's up to you whether you want to do that or not. Uh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Taxes, um, you said, said they would not necessarily go up, but if you request money mm -hmm. through some sort of uh, improvement, sure. would there be then an increase in your taxes immediately? Uh, what your tax bill is comprised of, it's a function of your valuation, the valuation of your property times the local tax rates charged by all the individual taxing bodies. So um, none of those are impacted by TIF other than if you, you know, improve your property in some way, that can cause an increase in valuation, which then you multiply that rate times the increased value, causes your taxes to go up. So, um, so I don't know if that, that answers your question, but yeah, so, so solely by being in a TIF district, your taxes won't go up. It's, it's value, valuation times tax rate. But then if uh, so many people in your street say, A nice idea that your house value goes up because the next door neighbors goes up, but in reality, that just that just doesn't happen all that often in very many places. Um, again, that you're more you're more so talking like busy suburbs where property values do skyrocket. Downstate, that that just gen generally doesn't happen all that often, and unless you're next to again a commercial property, that might be the case. But again, you always have an option to appeal your taxes if you think it's artificially high. Yes, ma'am. Since this tip district two has been in place since 2015, right? Um, have there been many redevelopment agreements? Can you share with us some success stories, success projects? Yeah, and uh, overall in the Heights, both our TIF districts have been pretty successful. Um, Treff, the Trefskers is is kind of the what kick-started everything. So, and that's a perfect example. They sunk a bunny, bunch of money into that building. It didn't generally create the increase in value relative to how much money they spent on it, but because that happened, then other properties around that start, started to develop, and then there's been a lot of other um, projects that kind of stemmed from that. So, um, Trefskers is one at Heritage Square. The, yeah, that's fine. Specifically thinking District 2. Okay, um, I don't. Now we're adding, so, so this district has been in place since 2015. I understand we have a desire to make it larger. I'm just interested how successful has it been and why would we enlarge it? Yeah, TIF 2 started a little slower than TIF 1 did. Um, but again, the part of the reason that TIF 2 is being expanded is because there has been some businesses that are going to be taking advantage of this. So there's definitely two in the books. There may be two or three more that happen in relatively short order. So that's the reasons there's a demand demand for it from developers. Well, without naming any specific business, there's genuine interest of current business owners on War Memorial Drive to expand their businesses. Uh, Nick, is funded. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. How is this funded anyway? So where's the money come from? Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, you take all of the property that's located in the TIF district, and and you know, 
Let's start today as an example. If we were to put this TIF in place today, whatever the valuation of your home is right now, um, you currently pay property taxes. And those property taxes are comprised of all the different levies for the local taxing bodies. So that would be your school district, the township, the county, the village, um, you know, fire district, um, you know, all the taxing bodies. They, they levy against your home, the valuation of your home. Okay. Once the TIF is put in place, so say your house is worth $100 today. The tax rates times the $100 is the tax bill that you pay today. But say your, your house is worth $105 next year, okay? The tax rate times that additional $5 that it, that it increased, instead of that money going to the taxing bodies, that money goes to the village's TIF account, and then that's the money that is used to do all, the, all these development projects. So and generally, the existing properties don't generate so much. It's the new, you know, the new buildings and the new construction that generates the most meaningful amount of increment, and that's where most of the money in TIF districts comes from. If I may, uh, just a little uh, side note about property taxes. For every dollar a homeowner in the village pays in property taxes, the village only gets <coughs> about a nickel of that. So. We, we, don't, um, we don't pay our bills on property tax, but so we're sales tax dependent, and sometimes uh, folks think we pay too much attention to development, but that's how we pay our police department, that's how we run the village, run the public works department, plow snow, is because of sales tax collections primarily. So we just, nearly every nickel we collect uh, on that dollar goes to police pension fund. And uh, so it, it doesn't go really for any operations at all. Now, school is very sale, uh, very property tax dependent. If you look at your bill, about 66% goes to the school district, roughly. That, don't have that figure. Roughly 60 plus percent. And then the park district takes a big bite. Um, <clears throat> The airport authority takes a bite, but we don't we don't get much on property tax. Uh, Nick, um, I know you, you may have covered this in part, but could you give an example of a homeowner right now today, not in a TIF district, who might want to add a bedroom and a bathroom and maybe um, a new roof, spend thirty, forty thousand, not in a TIF district, but if that same homeowner in a TIF district, um, how that might look different, especially with the tax bill, because once you start that construction, you come up to get the building permit, it right. so, causes the assessment to go up. Sure. So whether or not you're in a TIF, um, if you do those types of improvements, if you build an additional room you know, outside the existing footprint of the home, your evaluation is going to go up, so your taxes are going to go up. All right? the, the taxes that you pay aren't any different whether your house is, and the addition to it is located in a TIF district or outside of a TIF district. What the difference is that additional amount that you do pay, where does that money go? And if you're not in a TIF district, that money goes to the taxing bodies. If you are, that money goes to the village's TIF account, and then that, that money has to be spent on TIF eligible expenses. So again, generally that has to be done within the TIF district, um, and that can be used on public infrastructure work, or can be used to incentivize private development, or can be used to reimburse the homeowner for some of the costs that they incurred to do the additions. Does the board have any questions? Nick? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, I saw a hand out there. Is the vision in you guys' mind more commercial or more private? As far as residential, or are you guys looking for more commercial development? Well, I think both. Um, I mean, that's that's one reason we've incorporated the residential piece to this because that's very important to us. Also, that's why I, I mentioned the landlord registration program, the code enforcement. So, the things we've started years ago. I look at this as this is kind of a component of that. Um, but development is also very important, like the mayor just mentioned. And uh, you know, we have had a lot of development downtown, but we're seeing increased development on Galena Road, uh, down on Ward <coughs> Drive. So, um, but residential is very important to us. But to put a percentage on it, I I couldn't do that. But I, I'll just tell you that that's that's very important to us. I just threw that out there. The the board can f uh, frame that however they want, whether it be a matching. That, that could be. It could be a lot. Whatever options, you know, they put in place. There's a million iterations yeah. of those types of programs. So some of them can be lower no interest loans. Some of them can be forgivable loans. Some can just be flat out grants. Some of them can be, you know, 
whatever you do does cause an increase in valuation, so we'll give you a percentage of the re new revenue you generate back. I mean, there, there's a million ways to structure those. And I'm behind the levels where there are all kinds of rumors flying about proposed ideas. So if I put $10,000 in my house, is there a chance that somebody, after I do that, is going to come and want to buy it from the only thing I can say is, you know, what I've heard about development, whether it be rumor or not, um, I've heard nothing about coming in and taking out residential property at all. The, the, you know, the, the rumors I've heard, the, the developers I've talked to, they're looking at, you know, areas that, uh, whether it be a vacant lot on War Drive, but I've not heard anything about residential areas being bought up or even approached. So, yeah. And then but again, if someone does approach you, though, just ask for ten thousand more dollars for your property to so get recouped. <laughs> yeah. If you don't want to sell your house, you don't have to sell your house. But yeah. somebody comes and wants to offer you more than what you got into it. <laughs> if I could just comment really quickly, I think in some of the meetings that I've been sitting in to answer your question, the goal of the Heights is a healthy mix of residential and commercial development. And this particular idea, they did want the two TIFs contiguous uh, for all the reasons that the attorney said. But in addition to that, we have had conversations with the school and it was at the recommendation or at the request that some of the residential properties were included in the TIF to help create a healthier environment in residential and to support the school. So um, I don't know if that answers any of your questions. Well, and let me also say too, you know, we have, we've enjoyed great success on the commercial side. We have had now interest on the residential side. Larry Herman built the apartments on Durier. Um, those are all full. The Samuel development is occurring. We've done a couple of market studies that would verify that there is a demand for people to live in Peoria Heights and to live here and to send their kids here to our schools. But the housing stock really needs to be reset a little bit. And we really want to bring back and, and foster and help the middle class homeowners. So some of the development that's occurred has been on the high market side. This is an effort to really, again, to help middle class homeowners improve their properties and to stay here in the village and keep you here, whether you're retired or if you're raising a family, to keep your family here and uh, send your kids to our schools. That's really what we're trying to accomplish. And, um, I, I'm hearing, you know, a lot of good questions tonight. But if the if the neighbors didn't want to be in this, we could, you know, draw the line elsewhere and just connect the two commercial pieces. But again, this that's what we're really trying to do. And and if if this moves forward and gets approved, we would be wanting to listen to all of you on on this plan, how it would work, and what your needs are. And that we'd be committed to that. And I would add that um, in order for the village to be able to spend money on a TIF project, the type of project has to be included within the plan for them to be able to spend money on it. And this plan provides for all the different types of development the mayor mentioned, both the commercial side and plenty of residential type projects. So the, I, the intention is to undertake both. It sounds to me that if, the, if there's a way to match um, money that would be put into the property, the property put all that in it. Uh, then at the time that you wanted to sell them, it would just use the value of the property and you pay more money. Yeah, that's the idea. Well, it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Nick, uh, I just wanted to um, latch on to Mike's comment about um, the des desirability of the Heights as a place to live. And I mean that's our real that's our real um, uh, that that's our greatest asset. And I'm just hoping that the components that this is involved with. I mean, of course, each one has to be considered as it comes up about what is to be done, but that it contributes to the livability factor. And it, I mean that's very questionable sometimes on the busiest streets. It's just really, really tough. So I would hope that if there's something that comes as a result of the tip, that it gets interest and there's uh, some uh, revenue that is being put into the projects, even no matter what corner of, of the tip that they are, that there's something that has a high quality, livability, walkability, all the modern features that are 
you know, sorely lacking, unfortunately, in some of the other TIF districts on the other side of the border in New York. And we just really don't want a warehouse type thing like, you know, uh, ended up in the Midtown Plaza in Peoria. And, you know, something that we hope that all the good components are there and it, it, it has a mix for all of us. Oh, Dan, great comments. And you, you mentioned a development that I think was disastrous for the neighborhood. And um, you know, we would all pledge you we don't want anything like that that occurred and that that development. And I would ask you all to take a look at the way the village has done its TIF districts. Again, we we, we d don't do any harm to our schools. We don't want to harm the neighborhoods. We want to do everything we can to help the neighborhoods. So there's. Um, like Trustee Getz said, it's it's all market driven. So, if people don't want to sell your house, don't sell your house. But there's no interest by any developer in this neighborhood at all that we are aware of. But again, there is a demand. There is a demand out there for people who are looking for homes to come to Peary Heights and live. And uh, so we we really just don't have that. So taking this a step further, not only do we want to improve the current housing stock. Later on tonight at our meeting, we have a lot of vacant lots in Peoria Heights, and we would like to build affordable homes on those lots as well. So um, it's a challenge. It's a very complex challenge, but it's a good problem to have. We don't. We no longer have people leaving. We have people who want to move here. So that it's a great problem to have, and we're, we're excited about that piece of it. Bottom line is, uh, all the business in the world doesn't do us any good if we don't have residents in here to enjoy these businesses and continue our schools. I've grown up here. I don't want to see anything to hurt our neighborhoods. My grandkids grow up are growing up here. Perry Heights is great. I mean, we businesses are good to support the neighborhoods, but the neighborhoods is what makes the town. So that's my opinion. So. Well, again, we don't want to, the last thing we want to do is overpromise and underperform. But having grown up a good part of my life in that in that neighborhood, um, I see great potential there. Especially again, uh, if we can get some sort of a streetscape for Monroe and start rebuilding the neighborhoods there, um, we've got great police department here, and maybe help foster some neighborhood associations to get going, to have housing programs that invest in in your homes. Then uh, you know, we've got fantastic schools. So again, this is a pilot, but I think. I would challenge you all to take on this um, challenge and uh, let's do something really special for the neighborhood and for Peoria Heights. Are there any other comments? Are there any other comments? Oh, yes, go ahead. Ms. Foster? Um, I would say at a minimum if you're looking for a program um, any money you spend now would not be reimbursable until the TIF is actually put in place so I at a minimum wait till November of this year, but even then, just to have some surety, you know, you want to, you may want to actually see a program if you're wanting to rely on that program. But if you need a new air conditioner, I would certainly do that tomorrow. So, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so the I think the village has plan. What I'm hearing, the village definitely has a plan to do a, a home improvement type program. Um, as far as the parameters, um, what th th that type of cost is eligible under the TIF Act. So legally, the village could reimburse the cost of rehabbing a roof. Um, but what the program actually looks like and what the parameters are that the village puts on the homeowners, um, I just don't think that's gotten too far into the discussion yet. So I couldn't say if they're wanting to you know, incentivize roof repair or just facade repair or internal home improvements. I, I think it's a little too early. Uh, to, Nick, to I, I don't that. want to get too far down the road, but would it be possible, in, uh, maybe in some of the communities you work in where the village would have a 
preferred list of contractors who might give additional discounts to people in this district for either siding or roofing or is that is that a possibility yeah or, or working the other way the village could reimburse more if they use local contract contractors so that, that's another way that some municipalities approach it too so um, so again that the we haven't really developed the what the program's going to look like yet but Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's possible, yes. Carol, one more than Hugh. Did you have a question? We'll get to you next. Go ahead, Carol. Uh, so, didn't you say that person, if they have things that they need to do, that they should fill out a piece of some kind of form that you have and submit that so that uh, so that later when the tickets? Nick, how? How would that work, Nick? If, um, yeah, if you want, the village has a TIF developer application um, outside of just like a, a home improvement program, but any anyone that wants to do any type of an improvement or undertake a commercial project can go to the village, request a TIF application. Um, that application has, you know, you provide a description of what you're wanting to do, the types of costs you're going to incur doing it. And then we'll be able to analyze that to determine if there's going to be a TIF impact and, you know, what, what the village can do to incentivize that project if they choose to. So that's something you can, you can do now, but... Um, what's that? Well, generally you're going to get um, contractors to provide bids of how much it'll cost. You'll know roughly what, a, what something like that would cost, so... What's the time period of that application? Is there a time frame of the application process? You said that has to be analyzed. Is there uh, as far on our end, we can do that stuff pretty quickly. So it's just more so a matter of if the village is wanting to undertake that type of project. So yeah, it's not long. Hugh, did you have your hand up? Or? I did, but I wasn't sure of the format. Is this conversation? Um, Talk about TIF expansion. Right. Is there a public input section later or other? This, this is a, a, well. We're taking questions, but if you'd like to make a public comment on the TIF expansion, please. Uh, yeah. Okay, we haven't started the board meeting. Uh, this this is a public hearing running running a little late, but okay. All right. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, I would uh, before I ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Even though the questions have ended for tonight, please uh, either email uh, Dustin or call. We want to make sure that we answer all of your questions and any fears that you may have. This is just the beginning of the process, so it's to hear your, your opinions and to have your voice heard. So we want to move forward in this. Maybe if, with the internet, get online and take a look at some other communities. We want to hear what you have to say. So thank you all for being here tonight, and I would ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion. I second. And so I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the public hearing is closed. Aye.